Good morning, everyone. Um, we're just waiting for a few more people to log on and we'll get started. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, it's a beautiful day out there, so we really appreciate that you have chosen to be on your computer right now. <laughs> Um, if you don't know me, my name is Veronica. I'm the general manager at House of Paint Festival of Urban Arts and Culture. Um, before we get started, uh, I do think it's important that we acknowledge that we are living, working, and existing on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory, um, aka Ottawa. Um, Ottawa and Gatineau is built on land where three rivers meet, and it is a very, very sacred site to the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Um, like the parliament buildings exist on stolen land, and I think that is something that we would do well to remember and continue to honor our First Nations brothers and sisters on this land as the traditional keepers. Um, we have a really exciting program to start the Knowledge Conference. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read off part of his bio for you. Um, David Gordo Strickland has been quietly lurking behind the scenes of an engineer, a mixer, and a producer on hip hop and R&B records for the last two decades. He has worked on tracks with the likes of Pete Rock, Eric Sermon from EPMD, EPMD, Keith Murray, Redman and Method Man, and most crucially, he has been deeply involved in almost every one of the groundbreaking Toronto hip hop acts that really made Toronto Canada's center of hip hop music. Um, he's worked with Chaos, Ghetto Concept, Cardinal Official. Many of these are House of Pain alumni artists as well. Um, Julie Black, Divine Brown, Len Lewis, Shoplair, and Drake. Yes, that Drake, the one from Degrassi. <laughs> um, David Strickland was in on the ground floor of the Oboe Explosion, turning in Grammy-winning work behind the boards on Drake's album, Thank Me Later, as well as the monster hit successors, Take Care and Nothing Was the Same. Born and raised in Scarborough, Ontario, David grew up in the infamous Gilder Housing Project. As an Indigenous Canadian with deep roots running, in genera running generations back to the East Coast along Mi'kmaq, Inu, and Beota lines, his family is from Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador, Northern Quebec, and he has strong Cree and French roots that trace back to Samuel de Champlain. David Strickland is one of the few Indigenous audio engineers in North America. He's recognized by, he was recognized in the Vice documentary by Noisy, first out here, Indigenous Hip Hop. Um, I've seen that documentary. It's really, really amazing. Dreesus and Saudi Nose Red Kids are also in it. If you get a chance, definitely check it out. Learn more about David and about Indigenous Hip Hop. But before you do that, David Strickland is here with us this morning to talk to you himself about his own experience and about the evolution of hip hop in Indigenous culture. Thank you so much for being here and welcome David Strickland. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for that light acknowledgement. Before I get started, I want to uh, run through a couple things. Uh, hopefully this is not too loud for you guys. We're in my house instead of me being there. So I'm going to play a couple songs, little snippets to see if you guys um, know a little bit about the history or my history. See if you're familiar with any of these. I let down the main gate. 
four years from now, I'm just too long to wait. I laid up in the cut like a microphone master. Blame of a nature, we some know. Uh, mm. uh, look in the mirror, all right. mm. tell me what you see, keep uh, all, keep it all, baby, uh, uh. Uh. When we do it like oh, I can keep going. I'm gonna keep going. Now check it out. Let me know. Tell me what's really going on. Trizzy back up in this thing, I'm ready. What's happening? Shit is real out here. Drop down, drop down. Shit is real out here. Drop down, drop down. I'm I'm just I'm just skipping a lot of songs. Yeah, yeah. I just kinda wanted to give you guys a feel of the history. Um, there's so many songs that I'm, I'm missing there. Um, just to give you a little reminder um, about the amount of songs that I've gotten to touch in, in music in this country um, and outside of this country. So we, before we get into it, um, I'm just going to read to you um, a guest editorial that I had the pleasure of doing this summer, this summer for DJ Booth. Um, which really touches on the topic today of, of, of what we're talking about, which is um, being indigenous in hip hop. Um, I, I prefer not to say indigenous hip hop as much um, because hip hop is inclusive, not exclusive. And by saying indigenous hip hop, we're creating a, a separate hip hop when there's only one hip hop. And I'm gonna touch on that later in, 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 in my discussion. Um, but, um, this this was uh this article was special to me. I uh, wrote this as a guest editorial um, in June, I believe in June. Uh, no, actually February. It says February. Uh, there's been a lot going on. Um, this was just before the pandemic, um, and this was for DJ Booth. And I'm just gonna read this to you before I get into um, um, what we're talking about today. Um, and this is definitely. Uh, on the same topic, but this is um, was very special to me. Uh, it's called My Connection to Hip Hop as an Indigenous Person. It was a guest editorial that I wrote for DJ Booth. Um, big up to DJ Booth for having me. This is the first time I ever got to write such a thing, like a guest editorial for a, a magazine. Um, yeah, so let me get into this real quick. It's, it's not very long, but it's long enough, and it's definitely interesting. And it was hard for me to write this because a lot of this wasn't, you know, things I ever thought about writing. Colonization and assimilation, two words I never associated with my life until I grew up and looked around and realized who I was and what I was doing. And now I came to where I was at that moment. A la new Mi'kmaq, decolonizing myself meant embracing hip hop and laying the foundation of hip hop music in Toronto and in Canada for future artists. 
between the late 80s and early 2000s, I lived in studios across the city, literally lived in the studios, um, working with everyone and anyone with true talent, rival crews, unsigned artists, sign artists um, for free, for money, for food. It didn't matter. Hip hop was my life and letting the world know we did it well in Toronto was my mission. Um, growing up, I was not aware of the implications of who I was. My self perspective was limited to my environment. The city had shaped me, uh, my view of who I was, uh, the city shaped my view. Uh, it was a multicultural concrete jungle and its inhabitants deemed me just another poor white kid. The reality uh, was a direct result of colonization and assimilation. My people were shamed and hidden from the world. Our stories yet to be told in full. However, the spirit of hip hop came into my life at a young age. It was new, it was raw and revolutionary. It baffled the conservative and the streamlined sentiments of the 80s around me. For the vast portion of my life, hip hop culture resonated with me the most. I was passionate about it, its roots, its history, people, the versatile, the versatile nature, and allowed it to be whatever the artists wanted it to be, often surpassing their initial goals. Hip hop has its own language, dialects, and heritage with traceable lineage, forms, and conventions. It gives the artist and everyone and its audience, sorry, an identity that is both individual yet collective. I also had a language and a heritage, culture and traceable lineage. Yet I knew so little about my culture, it was not proudly passed on. My ancestors were made to feel that being who they were, who they truly were in their everyday life was not good enough for centuries due to racism. Who we were as indigenous people became a secret hidden in plain sight. Now this may sound extreme, but that is the nature of colonialism. It puts the voice in the history of those who seeks it to subordinate on mute. It strips the culture of the people while altering how others see the colonized and sadly how the colonized see themselves. That is the most corrupted nature of a colonial mindset. You cannot introduce the true you because that introduction has been made for you, thrust upon you. Ideology such as this is harmful because the opinion of the colonizers is presented as the only view that matters. Colonialism has profoundly affected indigenous communities. There is no indigenous experience that epitomes the colonial violence, much like the diverse indigenous nations throughout Turtle Island, North America. Each experience is varied, nuanced, and valid. When people who are continuously subjected to colonial powers have said, we have had enough, it appears to come out of nowhere for those who have not been affected by this brand of colonialism. Often the reaction is confusion, defensive, dismissive, and sometimes complete denial. They're, they have not seen the destruction in their families, communities, or selves. They do not have to unpack the weight of all that. So as someone who was living, who was a living embodiment of assimilation, hip hop became a lifestyle and culture I could live out loud. Hip hop began in the Bronx as a voice for the African American peoples to tell stories based on the realities and truths in which they lived. Hip hop was a vehicle to reach members of its communities first, placing their narratives at the forefront above the curiosity of outside observers or detractors. If you were an outsider who wanted to participate, it was up to you to learn about the people, the environment, the motivation and sources of empowerment. The onus was on you. For me, the connection between hip hop and my indigenous roots came later in life. The relation to my Mi'kmaq culture was no secret. There was still a gap to bridge. No tangible traditions were compounded by living outside my territory. The connection between the two was ambiguous, non-traditional, and abstract. It took a lot of effort, help, and healing for me to have a solid understanding um, of what it meant to be an Indigenous person. 
there is the family, the heritage, uh, the community aspect, the historical, the traditional, and its relation to the present. Hip hop has always been a vehicle for self-expression. As I continued to explore my roots, the logical conclusion became my relationship with hip hop and my culture did not have to exist in polarity. I was fortunate enough to meet legendary indigenous photographer, Ernie Panicoli, whose body of work is synonymous with hip hop photography. I did not realize hip hop and my outlook as a Manu were so similar. The connection between both existed in me all along. During this process of decolonization and through my participation in hip hop culture, you know, the importance of storytelling in hip hop through the lenses of, of a marginalized community makes sense. Storytelling is a, a, a form most people are familiar with in some capacity, as we are usually introduced to the art form by our teachers at an early age, whether told to us, read to us, um, or illustrated or viewed on a screen, stories have the power to intrigue, inform, influence, and entertain. We all have stories that were told to us, that remain with us, taught to us, or helped us shape who we are today. Stories and storytelling continue to be a key element in teaching, sharing, pardon me, social engagement, and entertainment in the world. Where would we be without a good story to tell? Stories are fundamental to the human experience. Marginalized people tend to exist in this bizarre space, not being a part of the dominant culture while remaining acutely aware of its perspectives, norms, and values, and deeply impacted because of them. Storytelling through, storytelling through hip hop adjusts perspectives, giving way to the norms, predicaments, principles, struggles, triumphs, dreams, outlooks, and pride, unapologetically for its own, with the potential to reach anyone who hears them, because a good story told with integrity and emotional honesty is powerful. Art and music in Indigenous communities are intrinsic to who we are. Our stories have yet to be told on a larger scale from our perspective. And hip hop is a healing tool that provides a way for our people to tell our stories to the world. Storytelling in indigenous culture is equal to the MC and the four elements of hip hop, a conceptual framework based on the medicine wheel. A teaching is given in the form of a story by brother Erna Panicoli. Hip hop to me is native culture in the modern technological sense. The DJ is the drum, the MC is the storyteller, the b-boy is the dancer, and the group graffiti artist is the sand painter. My goal has always been to remain true to the spirit of hip hop, while also honoring my ancestors. Thankfully, through both, I have discovered that staying true to my roots was the deepest way to remain true to the roots of hip hop. And that was the article I wrote um, for DJ Booth as a guest editorial. Um, bear with me one second, please. Blow my nose. I don't have the virus, y'all. I'm, I'm good and healthy. Thank you for joining me. I hope you can bear with me while I was reading that. Uh, my name is David Strickland, in case you didn't know. A lot of people call me Gordo, um, my my real name. Um, like we used, to, we used to say, my real name that's an inside joke, is uh, Hawadnagipu, um, which means uh, North Eagle, Northern Eagle, the Eagle of the North. Uh, that's my real name. My colonized name is David Strickland. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I played a few songs at the beginning um, because um, sometimes people, you know, over the years, I've noticed, you know, because I'm in the background, people have been listening to my work and they don't always, you know, off the top of their head remember, but I'm, when I play the songs, then they remember. Um, there's so many, we can get into that all day. Um, now, like I said earlier, this is a little 
you know, I am going to be talking about the evolution of indigenous hip hop, but I'm not because really I'm going to be telling you my story and I've been an indigenous person um, evolving in hip hop in Canada and Turtle Island for that matter. But um, my story is not necessarily special. I'm just going to tell you my story and um, I want you to take it in and, and maybe see how it's impacted uh, um, the music scene here. Because, uh, like I said in that article, it's been a, it's been a nice, it's been a journey, you know. Um, so let me get on with it. Uh, I was born and raised in Scarborough, and you know my parents split when I was uh, about seven or eight. They separated, and I started moving around a lot, and landed in uh, Gilder, near Gilder, which is in uh, Midland and Eglinton. If you're familiar with Scarborough or Toronto. Um, and you know, like, like they touched on the bio, uh, my father is a pre-Confederate Mi'kmaq person, um, from Newfoundland. My family has deep history in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and Labrador. Um, and, um, my father moved here when he was probably about 18. My mother moved, my mother's family, who's from Northern Quebec, um, have strong French roots, go back to Quebec. Uh, sorry, back to France, like they said in the intro. Samuel de Champlain is one of my ancestors. I'm, uh, I also have um, Cree and Creole ancestors on my mother's side. And uh, so I'm pretty mixed up there as far as uh, different different uh, roots. And a lot of us are in a lot of ways. Some, not everybody's going to be straight up, whatever, you know. Um, but my mother came here, my father came here, and they met in Scarborough, and that's where I was born. Um, and I was born and raised, you know, very, um, very low key. I got started playing hockey when I was four. Uh, my my great uncle it was Jacques Plante, who's a uh, six time Stanley Cup winner, seven time Vesna Cup winner. And I just took to hockey, and pretty much hockey was my life. Uh, till about grade four when I started uh, playing these vinyl things here. I'm just going to pick up a record for you guys. And I started b-boying in grade four when I started getting more and more interested in music and buying vinyl. And that the dancing turned into DJing. And from DJing, I started, you know, you know, this is in the 80s when hip-hop was really starting to evolve. So you got to think of perspective as you would mid eighties. And, um, from DJing, I started learning how to produce. Uh, one of my friends was a rapper coming up in the city named rumble. And he brought the first SP 1200 into Canada. He was actually taught how to use it by scholar rock, uh, from boogie down productions. And he left it one weekend and that kind of like started the ball for me and my friends. I mean, we had a little spot where we'd all hook up and I would start DJing and we'd start learning how to sample and make songs. And that, you know, you got to think of the point of that. <laughs> Pardon me. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't raised taking piano lessons. I didn't go to school and they didn't really give me much participation in school. I didn't get to play the drums or, you know, I didn't have much musical background other than playing records and really being into music on the, on the radio. Um, so, you know, this is a time in my life um, when I started, you know, growing. I was in high school and we would do shows and we'd go to clubs and get on the mic. And, you know, a lot, you know, one of my friends battled uh, LL Cool J at, uh, I was going to say concert hall, but it wasn't concert hall. It was, ah, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's off of Young Street, Massey Hall. You know, there's, there's a lot of, times you know seeing first going to shows and it was a really formative time and you know i would freestyle anywhere and i, I was really learning um so around this time i i enrolled in radio broadcasting and i was you know dead set on doing hip-hop for a living now to give you some perspective uh my brother maestro who's on my album spirit of hip-hop was you know he was the newest thing at the time. This is like backbone slide days, you know, Mishimi days. So this is, you know, 
the, the era that we're talking about. And I knew a lot of people and I knew a lot of people in the industry. I used to go to all the clubs and I, I had a, you know, a, a group of friends that, that, um, I travel with throughout the city. So I, anyway, I, uh, I enrolled into Humber college radio broadcasting and, uh, I, uh, that led me into, um, enrolling in engineering school, Trevis Institute. Um, and this is around 94, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> and once I started learning about engineering and studio, um, life, I was kind of all in at that point, you know, it didn't matter. I was producing on my own, but I was just being able to participate in music was, you know, you know, a dream come true for me. And it wasn't to say that, uh, um, I was working on, it didn't matter if it was a, a, a hit record, just the fact that you could actually do this as a living, you know? So around this time is when I met my mentor, uh, Gadget. I work with Gadget and Sam Wellers at Audioflex, um, and Slam Studios in 306, which was, um, all situated in downtown near Regent Park. And it was, um, um, they were all associated with Trevis because I ended up working at Trevis. So around this time um, is when I kind of started cutting my teeth as an assistant engineer. And um, I started learning about, uh, you know, acoustics and building studios and the school was building. And I, um, I got to uh, help expand the school. Um, that got me into doing acoustics and studio building, which came in handy for me later. Um, and, you know, I was pretty much in a boot camp at that point. This is around the time when I started working with artists like, uh, Chaos, Ghetto Concept, you know, Jellystone, Cardinal Official, Socrates, Heart Chase, Marvel, The Grassroots, Point Blank, Jacques Claire, Julie Black. I mean, I could just go on and on. I'm missing so many people, but this was like, uh, uh an era in Toronto hip hop. You know, the Rascals used to come through all the time. Those guys had spots out here, and, you know. Um, this was definitely the, the next era after that 80s era, but this was uh, an era where there was a lot of firsts. You know, the Glenn Lewis album I worked on, you know, that was the first. Um, you know, Socrates getting signed to Warner was a first. Shockler being the first rapper signed to a Canadian uh, record company that was the first so I mean I was transition I transitioned very quickly from you know putting down the microphone giving up being an artist and becoming an engineer um, and I, I I produced you know I used to call it ghost producing but a lot of times I produced um, on the side and I, I kind of like stayed in the lines of studio etiquette where I I wouldn't cross certain boundaries unless I was asked, you know, so I, you know, I was still learning and I didn't want to, um, you know, be throwing beats at people when it was out of place. So I kind of stayed in line those times. Um, and I kind of let, let those skills grow before I became, you know, more involved in production. And, um, there's an etiquette to that. Uh, and engineering is a very, um, particular, industry studio engineering um you know like being a mechanic like a lot of special special skilled crafts um it's got its own kind of little world we have our own do's and don'ts and etiquettes and you know some people are really into that world some people are really get into that and i, I kind of went in blind and kind of learned as i went and at the same time i adapted pretty well because um they're not all bad things, you know, smoking and coffee part. Yeah, probably that. Um, so anyway, I was pretty engulfed in, you know, I, because of the people that I was, that was mentoring me, I was, you know, here I was this kid, this indigenous kid. Uh, you know, I say kid, I'm, by this point, I'm in my early twenties, living downtown, became a studio rat and working on all these, hip hop records from the city. And we were basically making history, whether we knew it or not. Um, and, you know, at the same time, since we were talking about evolution of indigenous hip hop, there was, um, 
hip hop coming from the communities. But what I didn't realize is what, as an indigenous person participating in this, um, all this music that I was making history on both sides, you know? Um, so as, as, um, as time went on, you know, we started receiving a lot of first or a lot of, you know, people, artists started winning awards, Genos, nominations, um, 2004, um, I think it was 2004, um, Glenn Lewis was nominated for best R&B performance Grammy, I believe. Anyway, it was the first Grammy award that I was ever nominated for, you know, for an album with my name on it that I engineered on it. So that was a big first for me. Um, and around the time when I was doing Glenn's album, I was working on, you know, the Seven Bills All-Stars ghetto you know, concept album. I was working on so many records. There was, there was like three prominent albums that I was working on that summer. Um, and then, you know, a bunch of side records that all became big songs. So when, when, you know, you start to look at awards and stuff like the Grammy thing kind of, you know, gave me a little perspective as to actually, you know, because you're talking now 10 years had passed in my life um, where I went from, you know, doing nothing to doing, you know, everything, you know, um, I was working with the best people in the city and, you know, a lot of us were the go-to guys. So I, I was very fortunate. Um, but a lot of that had to do with hard work. Um, because, you know, I was known to stay up for days and work and, and just keep going. Um, anyway, after that, I started, you know, traveling more often because I've always been going to New York. Um, because, you know, New York always had the flavor for hip hop um, being the Mecca. So it was always a thing to go to New York and get your swag on. Um, and during that process, I used to meet a lot of artists and a lot of producers and I used to connect. So around 2005, I started um, hanging out more down there. Um, Socrates was signed to uh, Kill House through Def Jam. And I've worked with Socrates most, most of his career uh, from the beginning. Um, proud to call him my brother. We, we talk almost regularly, like, you know, at least weekly I talk to him. Uh, um, my early part of my career and his early part of his career were kind of go hand in hand uh as many a night i spent in the studio with socrates we either cooking up a beat or writing a song or recording or whatever we were doing i just kind of followed um the, his lead because you know he was such a genius um and that's what led me to you know um working with red man and guys like epmd and and eric sermon and wu-tang and a lot of times it was just being in the right place at the right time and, and building relationships with people where um, I just was in the right place. And then, you know, because of my reputation for being a hard worker and getting the job done, I le I'm, I'd like to be called a finisher because you get the job done. And, you know, that, that kind of uh, led me to doing, you know, tons of, tons of songs that I lose track of, you know, and, I was in Atlanta in about 2010 when Drake started blowing up. Um, and that's actually the first time I met Drake was in Atlanta because uh, those guys were in town. And uh, my good friend uh, Forty came through to the studio and um, I ended up going to the show and I was like, wow. Um, everything that I had been working for, towards with all those artists in, in my career was, you know, what those guys were actually getting over. You know, the goal was always to blow up in America, you know, um, and we had some close calls, but we never really had, we never really had the, uh, that kind of uh, full on, full on success. Um, so, so um, I was fortunate enough to get enlisted into um, participating on that album, the, the first Drake album when he signed to Cash Money. 
young money, cash money. Um, you know, 40 and, and those guys, uh, you know, got me on board because, you know, we had been doing so much work in the past with artists like Jellystone and Divine Brown and whoever. I mean, I'm, I'm, I skip over so many people and I don't mean to do that, but there was, there's so many people that, um, that we've already worked with together. So it was just natural that, you know, if I had something cooking up, I'd call him or he would call me. And this is the way our, you know, friendship's always been um, in and out of the studio, you know, and working on uh, Thank Me Later, which was nominated for a Grammy for Best Album. Um, you know, this led me to working with other artists like Jamie Foxx and just, you know, mixing, getting back to working with Gadget and mixing together and, um, working on projects like Sade with, you know, when 40 remixed the uh, Moon in the Sky remix and we all got to work together, you know, um, <clears throat> then, you know, Take Care was next and Take Care was the big one that won the Grammy. And after that, the last record I did was, um, I worked on was, well, that's not true. The last one where I have credits on was um, Nothing Was the Same. I did work on a few others where I did drums and drum programming and uh, and um, drum sound design. Because one of the things I've, I've noticed um, throughout my my career was I seem to take to drums very well. I was always into making drum sounds and drum patterns and a lot of the producers I work with I end up programming for them just on the side and those, you know, uh, that's one thing I was doing for them. but. Um, so around this time I started thinking about, you know, because I started decolonizing a lot in, in about, I'd say 07, 08 slowly. And then, you know, I started doing ceremony and, and, and being more in touch with the community. And, um, I was starting to f figure out my place within the community, um, even though I was here. Um, and I started meeting people and thinking that, you know, you know, here I am, I do music. So I started finding artists and, and, and touching base and making connections and, and doing songs. And that's what led me to doing the spirit of hip hop. Um, and I found, uh, I didn't realize the impact and the implications of, of the connection my brother Ernie showed me that. And this is where I get into the part about the, the evolution because I myself as an indigenous person was evolving with hip hop. But what we're saying is that hip hop is indigenous culture and it's not, that doesn't just apply to us in Turtle Island. I mean, it's like a spirit that, you know, you gotta remember there's a context here about um, when they came over there was a time when we couldn't do our ceremonies. There was a time we couldn't play our drum. There was a times when we couldn't sing our songs. And if anybody out there has watched Rumble, the movie Rumble, um, Indians Who Rock the World, uh, wish they included a hip hop part of it because hip hop is definitely a part of that. Um, yeah, there was a time, and if you you see the how our cultures and traditions affected other forms of music, the same goes for hip hop. You know, we, we, that spirit is how I explained it. And Brother Ernie taught us how, you know, the, the elements and, you know, the fifth element of hip hop being peace, love, wisdom, and understanding is, is just what our culture is about anyway. Um, but that doesn't apply just to Turtle Island. That also applies to all indigenous cultures, whether it's Africa, Australia. If you go and check out, if you go to India, anywhere in the world, and you do a comparison, you'll see the similarities. Um, but this was from my perspective, our perspective as an indigenous people. Um, and it's not to, to take away anything from anyone else or to claim anything or to say that, you know, it was ours. It's nobody's. It's, 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 if you understand in our cultures and, you know, things, everything has spirit and all these things you see here, I don't own any of these things. So I like to pass things along. Um, I'm just borrowing them for the time that I'm here. So the same thing applies for that. Nobody owns these things. Our spirit comes and goes and everything has spirit. So we have to respect that. 
Um, so I'm not laying claim on anything like that. I'm just trying to open up the mind because, and the reason for that is because in the state of what's going on today um, in our communities, uh, I notice in my travels a lot of, and even with my own kids, a lot of, and just like myself, we take the hip hop music and hip hop has other forms, you know, if you look at how it was birthed in the Bronx, how, you know, a lot of it came from Jamaica and, and there's this whole history behind that. And if you look at some of those elements and you put it all together, you realize that, it, yeah, it's, it's storytelling, right? At the end of the day, that's what we're doing. Um, and a lot of times singing can be viewed as the same thing. Uh, so this doesn't just apply to hip hop, but um, we had reached a point where I realized the kids were taking to it and, you know, not so much the culture. And it depends where you go. Some places are different than others, right? Um, and I can't speak for everywhere. I can only speak for my experience. Um, and it, it seemed like something that was just natural and in my DNA. So I thought, you know, here I am. I didn't realize my impact per se. I was other people who had to show me my impact as a, uh, as an indigenous person uh, in music in Canada and music in in Toronto, um, and that's what led me to doing the record and to speaking more and to sharing my story to show other not just indigenous kids but you know anybody, and it doesn't have to be about music; it could be about anything. Because at the end of the day, I will, I don't, all I had was passion and, and, and the, the drive to work hard and, and, and all the skills I, I kind of like picked up along the way. And I, I have a lot of heart and, and the message really is to, to share that, that you could do anything you want if you, if you put your mind to it. And I know that may sound corny and all that, but you know, my struggle was real. I had a lot of mouths to feed and um, I didn't come from a wealthy family. I didn't have resources to, you know, and I went about things a little backwards, but I stuck with it and I didn't give up. And I was lucky enough to be around people who could notice my, my dedication. And that led me to do great things. And that's, that's the whole point of telling the story. Um, and I noticed that when I'm, you know, doing work where I'm out and talking with people and inspiring people is a big deal. See, you could be going around doing anything and taking the money and running, but if you can't give back and help, you know, like we've all been inspired by something. And I'm not trying to inspire necessarily people by myself or, you know, say that I'm the greatest or anything like that. I'm just trying to share my story and if it inspires somebody, it does. Um, if you look at the artwork behind me, you know, that all comes from the ceremonies. Um, I started painting when I was in college and I did it just to try to get in college as a secondary, but I kind of put that down and was doing music for 20 years. And when I started the decolonization and, and, and getting into that aspect, I, uh, this element came out again and I started you know, I ended up in the McMichael and, you know, so um, bringing that stuff back into my life that had been taken away for so many years made it made a big impact and in, in opening my heart to that because my, my parents and my grandparents and so many people in my family were, were, were devoid of that. Um, and you just think about all the things that it could have helped in, in regards to healing or, you know, so many aspects of their life. So um, uh, I just wanted to um, thank the House of Pain for having me uh, here today to share my story. Um, I was fortunate enough to pre perform at the House of Pain a few years ago back with Dreesus. I DJed for Dreesus uh, when EPMD was the headliner. If you were there, you would have caught me on stage at the back with the DJ while EPMD was performing, hanging out with my brothers from Long Island. And that was a great memory. So thank you, Chi McGuetch, for uh, letting me have that memory. And uh, I hope you took something away from uh, my story of uh, sharing with you uh, how I became to the point where I'm at and where I came from because... Um, 
sometimes people uh yeah sometimes people sometimes people um you know a lot of times people don't know who i am and, and that's okay i don't want people to know who i am but now it's time for me to share that story so i'm thankful for to have a platform uh um like this where i can reach as many people as possible and and just you know um, share the story go listen to the album spirit of hip-hop which is available on all platforms. I mean, everybody's on there. The album I put together, um, Indigenous Artists and Black Artists, EPMDs on there, Redman, you know, um, Socrates, Jordan, Whitey Don, Spade from Citizen Kane, the list goes on. It's a who's who of Indigenous artists and non-Indigenous artists. And, um, you know, um, it's a story in itself. So please go listen. Um, I know that I'm trying to leave time I could go on and on. I could talk to y'all all, all day. I'm trying to leave time for any questions. I was kind of looking at the time and going, okay, maybe I should wrap it up. Cause, um, but yeah, if, if there's any questions, um, I'd like to take questions now. Um, I don't know if I see in the chat, some things in the chat that I haven't been clicking on there. So we got a Q and A. Yeah. Oh, okay. He was talking about the the, the music. Um, I had the thing closed. Let me open this. Um. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for me? Because um, I could tell y'all more. Um, yeah, the cake for Jesus's birthday. I remember that. Um, Actually, that was a really good memory. That's that's the trip I met Aspects on. Uh, shout out to Aspects, who's from Ottawa. Um, Jesus and I drove up in my my mom's old suburban that I have, and uh, it was definitely a great memory. Um, that was his birthday. It was a pretty wild night. I've been to Ottawa before, but never like that. Um, and then, you know, my big brother's EPMD were in the house, so it was pretty special. That's where I met Aspects. And, you know, Aspects is on the album, and Aspects and I have uh, done, been doing a lot of music together since then. Shout out to Ottawa. Uh, we have uh, Gerald put their hand up, so I think they have a question for you. Yes, I do. Peace, peace. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, one love and respect to you, David. Um, yeah, I want to thank you for, for kicking off this knowledge conference, um, you know, in, in such grand style. That was me that put up, you know, we're getting things started like this, T.O. Classics. Every single one of those tracks are tracks of my, uh, of my, of my youth, my youth rolling into my, my 20s. That's um, so I want to thank you for sharing your story because as I'm listening to all of these, I won't lie, this is the first time I'm hearing your name. So I thank you for bringing yourself to the forefront because for those people who may not know, each and every single one of those artists, each and every single one of those tracks that you played, that's what laid the foundation for, you know, we, we, we talk about Drake, but those are the artists that laid the foundation for Drake to become what he, what he became you know, for the weekend, for all those later um, hip hop uh, artists coming out of Canada. But my question for you is, um, you know, and this is a question that comes up very often, um, you know, when we think about uh, Canadian hip hop and the media and, and landscape and you um, talking about that the, that the goal was always to blow up in America. And I want to bring this question to you as someone who's been behind the scenes for, for so many years to ask, you know, like, what is it about Canada that these artists couldn't have blown up larger than they did beyond the hip hop community in Canada. Because yeah, as you say, get a concept. I think of so many of these names, the, the full circle crew, Terra, Chase, Marvel, um, you know, like we can, we can think of Socrates and, and um, Chocolate and Card now, but you know, we got Why Look, we've got so many artists, Mathematic, like we can keep yeah. going on down this list, right? IRS, um, <laughs> point up. blank, like keep going, keep going, right? And so yeah, so that question, like, why is it that um, that we're, we're looking to blow up in the states when we have the groundwork here already? Right now, one of the things is, you know, I talk about this. Eric and I talk about this all the time. Um, and one of the big things is population. 
Uh, we don't have the population um, compared to America. Um, the other thing is, and this is what we talk about, it's the support. Now, I used to always call Toronto Haterville because you know how it's um, Screwface Capital. Screwface Capital, yes. <laughs> and, and you could be the best MC and we're still getting mad at you. And, and the problem was, and one of the reasons I had to not be here as much is because I'm like, yo, I can't keep working my whole life and then nothing happens because the people aren't supporting the artists. And when I was in the South, I would see the opposite of that. And what would, we would discuss is how the artists in those places, like you remember when Houston blew up, right? Remember um, the Paul Wall and the, the Boss Hog and all that, all that slim thug business was going on was because the communities were supporting the music that the rest of the country, and I'm talking in terms of America, because when you were in America, you don't think of anything else. You don't think about Canada. They don't think about us. Who, what, if you bring it up, maybe, but nobody's thinking of it. Now, being a Canadian, you're not, you don't think like that, right? Because you're in Canada, even when you're there, you're always thinking about home. But when you're there and you're an American, it's not on your radar, right? Unless it's really good. So what was happening is in those places like Houston and when Atlanta blew up, even when LA, the community, you know, the two shorts selling out the back of the trunk of the car, all that is because the local communities are supporting the music and it started getting so big that the rest of the country was like, oh, what's that? And it became a trend and then it would blow up on a grand scale. And that's what it took to get it there. So our, we're being a disservice to ourselves in our, uh, in our business. Now, maybe we weren't good enough for everybody. Maybe that's what it was, right? We can't fault the people and that's not what I'm trying to do, but you needed this local support to build the groundwork to make even the labels, the music business, whatever it is. Because you had records that got through. How come Backbone Side got through, but certain other, you know what I'm saying? So that would, that's a big part of it, right? And we also need that validation too, as Canadian artists, we always seem, just like TV and movies, we always seem to need that validation from America. Maybe if we had a bigger population to uh, support our own, you know, but they do it in Quebec. If you look at st stuff like the Backstreet Boys, when they, they tested them out in, a, in Quebec and they blew up there before they blew up everywhere else. Because uh, Francophone music in Quebec, people want to support their own people and the arts and music. And that's why they, they get more funding and they have more artists build up and they have their own culture, right? And that's what we're not doing, whether it's indigenous or hip hop or whatever. We need to start investing in our cultures and supporting our artists and um, you know, sometimes it's not the artist or the people. It could be the right storm, you know. Um, and thankfully, we, and sometimes it just takes time or it takes the right artist, you know. Um, and Drake opened that door. But yeah, we did have to lay that foundation first, right. And it also is not just ironic, but fitting that some of the guys like myself and, and Gadget got to be a part of that because we did put in a lot of work. We did put, like, the, you know, I'm, we did a lot of records for free, you know what I'm saying? Um, and it was not about, oh, somebody didn't pay me. It's about we're investing in people. We've been investing in the artists, developing the artists, believing in people. Sometimes people just need a chance, you know what I'm saying? Um, well, respect to you for all your hard work, David. Thank you. Bless up. Thank you. Uh, David, we have a question in the comments, but we also have one that came in on Facebook that I would like to ask you. Um, sorry, actually, I lost it. I'm going to go back to it. Uh, however, there is a question in the comments from uh, Samyukta. Samyukta asks, you mentioned beautifully about decolonizing yourself and regarding defining hip hop for you. Uh, Samyukta works on decolonizing dance projects as a, I'm so sorry, Samyukta, I can't pronounce this. Can I unmute you? Would you like to ask the question yourself? I'm going to invite you to unmute because I think. You don't want to. Uh, mm -hmm. the dance, uh, there we go. Samyukta? Maybe it's the 
I can read it and get to the point, even if I can read the word. Um, she said she works. Uh, she said she works. You know, the style of dance. Was, was she there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was my first steps? A few steps through the, into decolonizing performing art practice. So for me, um, it was. Let's see. The thing is, I was. I didn't put them together at first. You know what I was doing. Just it, it's it's kind of weird because pretty much it kept me in. I used to always try to run away from music and I always got pulled back in. So I, they were kind of like two separate things. So what I started doing is, it's actually funny, it was on my own studio and I stopped in at the Native American. No, I couldn't hear you, sorry. I stopped in at the Native American, uh, sorry, the Canadian, oh, geez, how can I not even remember the name? The Native Canadian Center in Toronto at Spathers, Spath Spadina and Bloor. So I lived in Scarborough at the time. The studio was near, it was the studio we had when we did Take Care. So it was near, um, anyway, it was in the West End. And I was taking the subway at the time. And I I was, you know, reading lots and talking to my elders lots. But I wasn't getting a lot of hands on. So I stopped in randomly and started speaking to somebody who's now a good friend of mine, Cheryl. Shout out to Cheryl. And... Uh, what had happened was I just wanted to like, you know, be around people like myself, let's say indigenous people. And I just kind of like randomly stopped in. And that's when I started meeting people and they said, Hey, there's a social tonight. Why don't you come back? So I went to the studio, did a little bit of work, had lunch and went back and uh, met a, uh, a fellow there they introduced me to and I just started going back and meeting people and I slowly started learning about my own culture you know um, sure I'm on Anishinaabe territory um, I live in lands you know in Mississauga people's lands and you know there's very a lot of our traditions are similar they're not all exactly the same um, but it was a good starting place for me. And that led me to, you know, becoming a firekeeper, doing sweat lodge, um, doing fasting, picking medicines. I could tell you guys stories about that for days. Driving to Winnipeg with all the healers to go pick uh, medicines to bring back to Anishinaabe Health for the communities. And so many things it led to. That one thing, just stopping on the way to the studio, because I was tired of reading and wanted to engage with people because I didn't have the resources around me. And that eventually led me to putting the two together because I'd go to uh, community events and I would never tell anybody what I did. I wouldn't tell people who I was. I wouldn't tell people. And I'm like that anyway. I don't like the spotlight. I don't walk in the room and go, hey, I'm so-and-so because I don't believe that what I do is anything more special than any what anybody else does, whether you deliver food or anything. Every job is needed and valid and people all work hard at those jobs so it should all be respected and I've done them all. Not all of them but I've done a lot of jobs I didn't want to do. So I don't try to act like I'm better than anybody because I've been lucky enough to work on some things that have been successful or whatever you know. Um, so I don't really talk about that and it was slowly after people started finding out that I you know that led me to meeting people like Q Rock or Brother Ernie. And and that's where I started putting the two together. And that's when it was like they started coming together and then I started making them go like this, right? To become a thing uh, where it was like two different wings of one bird, so to speak, you know? And it really made me stronger and, 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 I, and I became a better person for it. I didn't, I don't go around being negative towards anything that, uh, you know, like the decolonization and I don't get, try not to like bash anything. I just kind of try to learn and add to the arsenal and pick up new things and let go of things that I don't need. And, and that's the way that I try to approach it. Um, I hope that answered the question. Thanks, David. Uh, I have <laughs> re-logged into Facebook and uh, there's two questions there. The first one is from Sue Ellen Gerritsen. And Sue Ellen asks, how do you think funding agencies could help get funds out to Indigenous hip-hop artists? 
Well, you know, a lot of the grants are based on, you know, you know, places like Factor and government things like you have, for example, in on we have Ontario Arts, we have Toronto Arts Council, then there's uh, Canadian Arts Council. Um, and then within each of these, you would have indigenous categories and then, you know, non-indigenous categories. Um, but then also there's grants available through bands and band councils and different ways. So as artists, um, sometimes you, um, you have to kind of like sit your butt down and figure out, you know, the grants are a huge resource, but a lot of people don't do the work. I'm guilty of it myself. Um, I have people work for me and do stuff. Um, but I always looked at it. See, a lot of people, I used to look at it early on as people look at it like as they don't want to ask for help and they don't want to ask for money and stuff like that but they shouldn't feel that way um it takes it takes money to to make your music it takes money to own your own your craft so um i think what they should start doing is um is really um um it's it's so hard because so many people slip through the cracks, but you got to take a step back and maybe look at coming up with different approaches because some of these grants are like, you know, I'm not complaining, but some of them are, are low enough and that they only help so much. And then some of them um, are overwhelming where you get so much and you could like, there's got to be a system where, we can, um, yeah, we give funds, but we also give support in other areas that end up not being paid for. Where you know, like for example, people are doing like, like you have a talent pool where they're like, okay, I got a grant, right? I did my album, but I don't have any money to shoot a video. Oh well, we have all these video guys, and they they you know maybe there's a grant in there that goes to pays the video guys that they're available to those artists who receive the grants because a lot of times the videos are just as much or if not more expensive than the songs and then you know you're not meeting meeting people and you know there's all these other factors that come into play that the grants aren't covering so like i'm thinking maybe there's ways that we can utilize all the different people who have play different roles and putting them together within the grant structure you know what i'm saying so we have in the comments, um, Adria, who raised a very similar question to Sue Ellen, and um, I'm hoping that maybe I can unmute Adria because she did go into a little bit more detail and maybe we can follow up on this. Um, Adria, you are allowed to speak. They look muted. Are they muted? Adria? I don't hear it. Uh, well, uh, Adria's comment was about how how to how can the funding organizations themselves uh, increase outreach and have a greater impact with their outreach for funding opportunities specifically for Indigenous artists. Um, would going through studios help? Yeah, well, a lot of times, see, here's another issue, is the, some of the communities are far away. Um, I had an experience recently where somebody had an issue with their equipment and they couldn't get it fixed in time because they were so far away. And getting out there and getting to the artists and finding out, pardon me, in some communities, for example, internet's slow. So people aren't as online as much, right? We're in the cities and we're used to being online on our phones and stuff. And it's not like that in the rest of the country everywhere. Some people don't lock their doors and some people don't have that phone in their hand all the time. Um, so um, really um, you need to kind of look at where's the funding coming from and where, where should it be going, right? Um, and it's hard to, to map that out um, because you don't always know 
you know, this the funding and if people aren't applying and a lot of times you end up with, with funds left over because of that. Um, so identifying the artists and that, that is a big issue we need to kind of look at. Um, um, maybe there's a better way to do this sort of thing because think about it. Okay. You have, I just mentioned Ontario right there, Ontario, Toronto, Canada. Then you have other places, right? There's Ontario Arts one. There's all these new ones. I can't even keep up. There's tons of grants. If you were to take all the grant money and put it together across the country from local level to a federal level, I wonder how much that would be. Let's let's take a wild guess. How much do you think? Billion dollars? How much of that money is being left over and not used? How much of that money is getting is going to the same people now, remember, there's artists, because we do a lot of funding in Canada, who are top-selling artists who have record deals and all this stuff, who end up getting a lot of that funding, too. And some of the same people keep getting that funding, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I'm sure it happens. So how much of that's happening? So if you took all that money together and then look at the population, it's probably staggering. Maybe there's a way we could better be doing this because you're sitting there waiting and it's like, you know, sometimes you try something and I'm not dissing the grants. Grants are great. I love grants. It's a great thing, but maybe there's a different way. There's Maybe there's a different way to approach this whole thing. But then the other problem becomes putting it all together, right? Um, so, I mean, it's a tough call, man. You gotta, you gotta I guess, you gotta just, keep applying um yeah exactly the culture like i was gonna say it'd be if you had a team of people who could go around and if we could get a gauge of how many artists we actually have like how many like even if you look at outside of the indigenous communities if you just look at how many successful there's a lot but there's going to be a, an amount that's going to top out at um because you have different categories of music you have different levels of success so if you start delving into that, there can't be, you know, there's only so many people in the country. So um, I get asked, you know, questions about who's the best, you know, now or who's the best from the past. And I mean, man, even under the circumstances, we have a lot to offer. So, I mean, it's, it is important as well. But yeah, we we need to perhaps find a network that we can bring everybody together with. And I've been trying to do some of that too, which is why I did the album was to try to bring, you know, a lot of the artists on my album are from different communities, sometimes different genres. Sometimes they know each other. Sometimes they work together. A lot of them have their own fan bases. Um, but I, what I noticed was some people knew some people and some people knew some artists, but when I brought them together, it, it gave it, um, a place for everybody, you know, everybody was together and some people never heard of any of them. So it was like, you know, having that, that place where we could all come together, right? Maybe that's, that's what we need. We need and I've been talking about doing something like that. Um, having, a, I want, I've been talking about having a space in, in the city, all indigenous studio, uh, indigenous run, indigenous engineers, different artists, um, you know, it would be a place for everybody, but it would be an indigenous studio, art, science, athletics on an indigenous land in the city for us, by us, and open to everyone, you know, but, um, but uh, kind of like a hub where we could all come, because what was happening with my album was, oh man, I got so lucky, so many artists were coming to town and I got to re I got to connect with them all and it was like, we were all connecting each other with each other. And that's kind of what we need. Some Somewhere we can all come together, you know? I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I'm trying my best to come up with an answer. Uh, uh, Gerald, oh, Adria has a follow-up. Uh, Adria asks, what about the idea of having a cultural ambassador to go out into the indigenous community? Yeah, yeah, I was talking about that in there because I seen that and I'm like, yeah, something like that, something, um, and I mean, that's also a hard thing to do because you have so many different agencies, you know, um, and I've been at meetings um, where people are, 
discussing stuff like that. But it's 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 a big task, and you know, at the end of the day, money's always funding is always is always an issue, um, and there's so many so many people that can help, and they just don't know how, right? Um, so tanks are another good thing. Um, I'm not sure if we have enough of those. Um, where people in the communities come together and come up with ideas and solutions to problems like stuff like this, right? Uh, Gerald uh, appears to have put his hand up, so I'm going to unmute you again, Gerald. No, that was a mistake. I probably just didn't lower it from the last time. <laughs> okay. Well, it's still good to hear your voice. Um, I do have another question from Facebook. This one is from Sabra Ripley. Uh, Sabra asks, do you see a difference in the way Indigenous artists engage with hip hop in urban settings versus on reservations or in more rural or remote communities? Can you talk about that? Most of the Indigenous hip hop artists I'm familiar with are based in urban settings, but I know that's just a piece of the picture. Yeah, there is a lot of artists I know that aren't in urban settings. Um, you have guys like myself or Q Rock. Q Rock, for example, is from Nipissing First Nation and um, he was moved to the Bronx when he was five. And, um, you know, he's like a brother to me, but he has similar experiences like me. Like I would be in Brooklyn, you know, and people think I'm Puerto Rican. People like, like white people don't think I'm white. And then there's not as much prevalent indigenous, like, you know, I don't know about outside of New York, but in New York, you know, most people don't see natives. And I know some other indigenous people, we laugh because I'm like, yo, they don't even call ourselves invisible. Um, but his experience was like that too, growing up there where they would call us Latino or that, you know, we're not that, we're not even, what are you talking about? Or people think I'm white or people think, you know, somebody just, I can't just be me kind of thing. Um, but the, the, the artists tend to be, becoming from the urban centers because I think there's just more access but now we have the internet and we have all these new tools and apps and stuff that the, the game has changed and as long as you you're dope uh, I don't think it matters where you're from anymore um, not everybody's you know from the city and you know Canada I mean pff, I always laugh I mean Toronto's what the fourth largest city in North America but outside of Toronto it all seems small to me because when you go to America, everything's so big. So I, I'm like, you know, there's so many cities that I never thought would have music. A perfect example. I'll give you a perfect example. I just thought of it. Well, back in 2011, I went to um, um, Shefferville, which is uh, northern Quebec. And my cousin, it, it's Shefferville is an Inu res in Shefferville. And about 15 minutes up the dirt road is um, a place called Kawawa Chikamach, um, the Scappy Nation. That's where I met Violent Ground. So my cousin was there and brought me up there. It's a fly-in only community. It's subarctic. There was snow this high in May. You know what I'm saying? And I met these two kids who were in the basement of their house on the res making beats on Reason and recording. And I was like, wow. And they're on my album and they have a, you know, they they live in and make music for a living now. You know what I'm saying? And it's not because of me. Uh, my point is that they're in the middle of nowhere and they were dope. Now they did have to move to the city. They did go to school, but you know, that's a whole other story. My point is that, man, there's, there's good music everywhere. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think the city has to be synonymous with hip hop. You know, just because it was birthed in uh, the Bronx and all that, how they say it doesn't mean, you know, you have to be in the city to be doing hip hop, Who's, you know. Thank you so much. Um, now feels like a good time to wrap unless you'd like to leave some closing statements or there's anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, I'd like to say thank you to the House of Paint. Thank you to everybody um, who's been watching, participating, and um, I hope you enjoyed uh, what I had to offer today. And I hope you have a great 
show, and I wish I was in Ottawa. I wish I was able to speak in person. I wish uh, I could, you know, be there. We could, I could enjoy all this, the music too, because I mean, I'm telling you, I had a ball last time. So, um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, Chimigwech, Wulalin. Thank you so much. And we'll have cake for you again next time, next time you come. <laughs> um, thank you, David. Uh, thank you everyone who joined us for this session. Um, you can follow David on Instagram. It's David Strickland, all one word. David dot Strickland. David dot Strickland. My apologies. David dot Strickland on Instagram. You can follow him there. Um, we have, a, this is the first session of four days. So we have a full afternoon and three more days of programming. You can look us up at houseofpaint.ca and uh, register for any sessions that you haven't, that you're still interested in partaking in. Uh, David, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your wisdom with us. Good luck and enjoy the show. And I hope you guys have a great, a great, a great event. Thank you so much. Uh, our next session starts at 2 p.m. with Mural Roots. They're doing arts administration and project management for artists. And we hope to see some of you there.